And this is surprises in object lifetime, and there's still people straggling in. I know that'll happen for the next few minutes. Now, um, Andre Alexandrescu is in this room, and he was just telling me that his goal is to be loud enough to get our room to complain about the noise. And then I was told that we should make it our goal to get Andre's room to complain about the noise, but if you've ever been to my talks, I'm not great at giving jokes. When I do, they tend to fall flat. But maybe we can come up with something to cheer at some point. Maybe if we hear them getting loud, we can figure it out. All right. So my name is Jason Turner. This is my intro slide. If you've been to my talks, you've probably seen something like this before. A couple of things I'll just call out. Uh, I am host of C++ Weekly, which is my YouTube channel, and co-host of CVPCast, which is a podcast. Um, I'll mention C++ Weekly on Friday more. OK, I'll ask that real quick here. Who watches my YouTube channel? Oh, it's pretty good. Cool. OK. Um, Yes, I am independent and available for training or contracting. If you're interested in having me come as a trainer to your company, that you can usually be worked out. Um, yes, move to the front. There are people in the back. If you know who I am and have seen my talks before, they are highly interactive. Gasper's getting in the front. Good job. Um, we, will, we will be doing things in here, hopefully, that are fun. Oh, and also this is approximately what my training looks like, so you have an idea what to expect if you do hire me to come to your company. Um, so I have a couple of upcoming things I want to mention. This is good as people are straggling in still. CVVCon post-conference training. It is not too late to sign up for that if you're interested. It's two days, Saturday and Sunday, right here. Well, not right here, it's upstairs. Um, and I will be giving a one-day training at CVP, C++ on C. If you're not familiar with it, that's a conference that's going to be in southern England for the first time in February in 2019. Now, this is a hypothetical. We are working on the concept for this of a three-day training thing that I'm considering doing with Matt Godbolt and Charlie Bay in the Denver area in the summer. That should be interesting because we have very different perspectives on things. So. Where you can hear us argue about things if you would like to. Um, OK, so about surprises in object lifetime. I have taught this one day course called Understanding Object Lifetime about 12 times now. <sighs> well defined object lifetime and our construction destruction cycle in C is one of the key features of C. We want to be able to well reason about the lifetime of things. Uh, and we're one of just a few languages where we can reason about the lifetime of objects. Sometimes there are surprises, however. And sometimes uh, they are for the better, sometimes for the worse. So let's start with what is an object. This is a key definition if we're going to talk about object lifetime. And I, I am cheating the, uh, the, the lights at the moment, so I'm off center. They're not blinding me as much, and I can see you some more. Um, OK, how is this thing, the struct that contains an int, different from an int? Yell stuff out. This is how it works in my talks. It has a label, so you said? So there's some sort of type. It has a different name. It has a different name. That's, that's, that's OK, yes. Gashper says it has a different name. So. If we were to look at them from this perspective, um, they have the same size. Using uniform initialization syntax, they can be initialized the same way. We can refer to them both as a reference to an integer. I say don't do this in real code on line six. Please don't do this in real code. But it is technically legal. We can reinterpret cast a struct as the first element of it. Um, and uh, we can assign them the same way and access them the same way. They look pretty similar. So if we look at some of our type traits, they are both trivially key constructible, trivially destructible, trivially copyable, and more to the point, they are both objects. So what is an object? The standard says an object type is a possibly Const volatile qualified type 
that is not a function, not a reference, and not void. Pretty much everything is, a, is an object. Okay. So object lifetime. Lifetime begins when storage with the proper alignment and size for a type is obtained, and if the object has non-vacuous initialization, its initialization is complete. At some point, I, I have this slide in a couple of different talks, at some point I should remove the bit about union because we don't care about that at this exact moment, although adding union to our surprises could have been an interesting thing to do. I did not do it in this talk. So if it has non-vacuous initialization, once the initialization is complete, its lifetime ends when, if it is a class of the non-trivial destructor, the destructor call starts, or the storage in which the object is occupied is released or reused, okay? Any questions? We're gonna do examples and interaction and stuff in a minute, yeah? Do you have a definition for non-vacuous constructor? Let's say non-vacuous initialization, um, let's say non-trivial initialization. Yes. Why did they not use that more familiar defined term? Why did they not use the more familiar term? I honestly do not know. And if there's someone who does know why vacuous is used here, I don't know. But that's a great question. Okay. So I have my simple utility here. Uh, that I've got the struct s, it has something that prints in each of the special member functions, and then I've got main, I am creating an object of type s on line 12, I am creating a scope, I am creating another object called s2 on line 15. All right, what does this code print if I were to execute it? Or probably no one's going to yell it out, I will say, what is printed on line 12? Line, line three, S, so it's, it's S with the parens. Okay, what is printed on line 14? Nothing. nothing, nothing, yes. Not everything prints something. On line 15, what is printed? S const S ref, so the copy constructor is called on line 15. Now, um, I have uh, this kind of annotation I personally use, you'll catch on in a, in a second here. What's printed on line 16? The destructor, yes, the destructor of S2 is called on line 16, then what is, how, what is called on line 17? The destructor. the destructor of S, so we end up with this. Now, um, just for the record, if we needed to at any moment in our talk, we can flip over to Compiler Explorer and actually test these things, so if we have any questions at all, stop me. We can prove, though, that this is what it prints, S, then the copy constructor, destructor, destructor. Good? Okay. Okay, now what is printed? What's printed on, on line 12? Constructor of S. Okay. Uh, we already said line 14 doesn't print anything. There's no change there. What do we, what's printed on line 15? Nothing. 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 Nothing's printed. This is perfectly safe. I haven't done any kind of implementation defined, undefined thing or nothing. Nothing is printed. What's that? It's a reference. It's a reference. There's no copy to be made. So uh, then line 16? Nothing. nothing. Line 17? Destructor. Destructor. Okay. So that's what it looks like. So remember that reference types are not object types. They don't, we don't talk about, they, they don't affect our lifetime. Mm, mostly. We'll show something where they do. Okay. All right. Now we're going to get into this. So uh, what is printed in this code? I have this function called get data. It is returning this constant ref, and, um, and then I'm printing it on line 9. What did you say, 42? Yeah. <laughs> That's as good a guess as any. Most likely 5. Okay. All right, so we are returning a reference to a local. It's garbage. This is unknown. This is undefined behavior. 
What warning do we get from the compiler? Returning a reference to local, sorry. I, it's for some reason easier for me to focus over here. If I am ignoring you, someone start doing jumping jacks or something, burpees, I don't know, something that I'll notice. And plus it's good because you're sitting all week basically anyhow. All right, so yes, we might get a reference to stack memory return, reference to local return, something like that. Are we surprised yet? The title of this talk is Surprises in Object Lifetime. Hopefully, we get to some, pri to some surprises in a minute. <sighs> okay, now it is printed. Now I'm returning a reference wrapper, not a reference. Unknown? It is still unknown, yes. We are still returning a reference to a local object. So this reference wrapper is implicitly taking a reference to i, the local value, and returning it. The question is, now what warning do we get from the compiler? Nothing. None. Probably nothing. No. Unless it's magic. Or the last, latest document about the lifetime. What's that? I'm sorry. Or the latest document about the object lifetime. Oh, oh, uh, if we were saying with like the stuff that Herb is working on right now, yes, uh, no, um, I'm just talking about GCC and Clang at the moment. Okay, um, so I'm compiling this here. My default's Clang. I've got W all, W everything, W shadow, and pedantic. No warnings are printed. We can see that in the lower right-hand corner. GCC makes this fun, because if I change it to GCC, sorry, wrong, GCC, we get this warning. Warning, I is used uninitialized in this function. Is I initialized in this function? I'm pretty sure I is initialized. This has become like a rule for me now. If I see a warning that makes literally no sense at all, I've decided I'm probably invoking some type of undefined behavior, yeah. Um, the only thing, so the question was, it's, uh, you said it's, it's talking not about its initialization, but its actual use inside of main. Yes, but the only place that we as humans see an I is in that function, and it has been initialized there. That is why I take issue with this. Um, what's that? Would it go away if I used no in line? I don't know. Uh, I can turn off all optimizations. No longer get the warning, yeah. So we, the compiler doesn't have enough information to see that here, yes. Okay. All right. So. Simple standard library wrappers around references confuse our analysis. That's our first surprise. Oops, sorry. Let's talk about strings. What is printed from main? Hello world. Does anyone question that hello world is printed? Global data. What's that? Global data, okay. Hello world is printed. Why is it allowed? The standard specifically says evaluating a string literal results in a string literal object with static storage duration. It's effectively a global, as you said. Um, initialized from the character specified. Static objects are valid for the entirety of the program. This is fine. It's totally allowed. Okay. We're now returning a string view. What is printed? Still hello world. Okay because string view is basically a pair of pointers to the beginning and end of the string. So we're not surprised, right? All right, now what is printed from main? 42. 42, unknown. What's that? It might not get to the point of printing. The most likely answer is hello world, says someone and who shall remain nameless in the front row. So 
with our magic of Compiler Explorer here, we can execute this. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's printing nothing. It says that that returned zero. It says it successfully executed, but it didn't print any data. And we can... Without O3? Without optimization? That is GCC, turn off the optimizer. It doesn't have, it doesn't have, it doesn't change anything really. Um, yeah, something like that. Well, that's an interesting uh, Unicode character that it decided to pick. Okay, so this is unknown. Why, I, I think most of you already got this. Since the string view is pointing to the begin and end of the string, the string object that actually stored this data was popped from the stack and our local string has gone out of scope. We already saw it in the Compiler Explorer. What warnings did we get from this code? Not a single thing. Okay. Uh, what does this code print? I'm getting confident hello world answers. Undefined. I'm getting a few undefined. Why, who wants to s describe why undefined? Someone, someone, you want to go with why? Okay, why? Uh, me? Yeah, you raised your hand, right? Oh. Basically, it's a table local, uh, local array. It is a, yes. Uh, initialized with global data, and we return the view into this local array. This, it's, it's, it's not much change from stood string. Right. So it's not very much of a change from stood string because this is a local array called S that is initialized with the global data, the character literal hello world, and then we are returning a string view into that. So the local array decays to the pointer, which initializes string view, and we get no warnings. That's fun. Any questions? So, surprise. This is how I phrased it. Strings live longer than you think they will, except when they don't. I've actually, um, I will take an aside right here. Many of you raised your hand saying you watch my YouTube channel. I did say explicitly in a recent episode that this is the one feature I'd remove to C++, remove from C++. Implicit conversion from array to a pointer has literally no use in the language whatsoever. We could require a static cast when it was necessary. You might say backwards compatibility with C, but you can throw the static cast in there if you really need to. So uh, that's the feature I'd remove. Similar idea here. Um, we are now initializing a vector, and we want to ask what is printed here when we push back an object of type S with this constructor. So you're saying uh, you're saying the S int constructor and then the copy constructor, and then destructor. Move, move, constru move constructor. The second one is the move constructor. Okay, how many people say the copy constructor is called? You have to have more confidence than this. Raise your hands higher. Okay, who says the, the move constructor is called? Okay. All right, so while well, the votes win, so move constructor uh, is what it's called. And that is because there is an overload for pushback for the move constructor. Um, how many destructors do we see? Okay, who says, how many say one? How many say two? How many say three? Okay, I think two, one also, so we'll go with two. <laughs> so yes, we have the uh, S init constructor, the move constructor, destructor, and destructor. So we remember um, that for non-trivial type, the destructor of the move from object must still be called. That's the takeaway here. Uh, Surprise! Move from objects still have to be destroyed. So that's a surprise for maybe a quarter of you. Yes. Um, and it's often non-trivial, often inlining the destructor causes code bloat because it has to decide. Like, for example, with pointer, if there's some resources that need to, excuse me, for example, with std string, it must decide if there are some resources that need to be freed or whatever. 
Okay, I have switched this to emplace back. You say it's the same? Yes, it is exactly the same, for exactly the same reasons you said. Same thing as push back. We have used in place back improperly here. The point of in place back is that we are trying to call the constructor of the object. And so I will build on that. Now I'm using in place back this way. So now what do we see? What's the first thing we got printed? S int. S int, and then what's the next thing printed? Destructor. Destructor of S. That's it. This is, this is the proper way to use in place back. Any questions? I just see a couple of faces that look confused, but okay. If you're not gonna ask questions, it's your own fault. All right, so this is the correct way to use in place back. If we're gonna use it, we, we're, we're, we're calling a constructor, is basically what we're doing. Um, worth pointing out this line here. We can call it with zero parameters, so we're calling the default constructor. So, even without a named object, we have to think about object lifetime. Now, I do think that understanding object lifetime is probably the most important part of understanding how to write good, clean C++ that is efficient. All right. What is printed here? Yes, what is printed? What is printed on line 12? S prints, all right. What's printed on line 13? Hello world, what's printed on line 14? Okay, does it bother anyone that this is a const reference on line 12? Because it is a, a reference to a temporary. Yeah. Oh, wait, sorry. Yes, Leslie. No, if you don't have const, it won't compile. You cannot take a non-const reference to a temporary unless you are compiling in a version of MSVC that is in permissive mode, specifically. <laughs> um, yes. So S, hello world, tilde S. So this is our, our surprise here. Complex rules allow for lifetime extension of temporaries that are assigned to references. If you want to look this up in the standard, it's in class.temporary. It is a lot of confusing things to read. Yes? In that example, might there actually have been two values set? Oh, um... We will, we will, okay, so the question was what there might actually be two different S objects in this case. I will say, hypothetically, before C++ 17, yes, but we'll dig into this in a little bit. Yes, yes. Actually, no, wait, I have to get back to that. Our, do our value references also expend a lifetime? I, no, but universal ones do, says Gashper. Or forwarding references, if you will. <laughs> okay, so for the sake of this slide, since someone asked, and I had not actually spent time to think about it, let's run through this real quick. The question was, might there actually be more than one S object created? And I will say by looking at it more closely, definitely no. Because we are value initializing, or excuse me, we are initializing on line eight the return value S, directly initializing the return value. We're not returning any local object at all. And then we have a const reference to the returned thing on line 12. Under no argument could you say that there is more than one object S here, I believe, except Ben's gonna disagree with me. Oh, it's unrelated to that. There's a specific case in assignments where you can have an R value value for a single R value, which is unstream the R value. It will take an R value and pass it to it, and of course it's, it's just a program. It's an assignment R value reference to it. And it's really dangerous. 
OK, we will not worry about that right now. <laughs> that, that's, I repeated the question for the YouTube video. <laughs> OK, so complex rules, object lifetime. All right. Um, I am now initializing a const int reference on line two with a, a temporary, effectively, one on line six and putting that in a const reference. What value is returned from main here? Okay, let's do it this way. Who says one? Well, we're, the two questions, the, the two options are going to be one and undefined. Who says one? Okay, who says undefined? Ooh, it's like 50-50. Okay, so since there was no consensus, we have to go to the standard. Um, it says one is returned from main. Lifetime extension rules apply recursively to member initializers. I was researching the answer to the last slide when I came upon this example in the standard. I thought I have to put this in my talk also. <clears throat> uh, the question was, what? And the answer is, <laughs> go read class.temporary. I think it took me four times of reading it. I, you read the standard more often than I do. You probably get it faster, but yes. Okay. I'm sorry, was that a question? Only for what kind of initializers? Uh, oh, uh, is it only for aggregate initializers? Um, no, I don't think it has to be a member initializer. I think I could have actually done a constructor that took an initializer with a, con with a reference into this. I'm almost positive, yes. I don't think it has to be, uh, yeah, aggregate. All right. How many dynamic allocations are in this code? We've got a vector of stood strings. Three. Don't worry about the version of the standard, actually, any version of the standard that'll compile this. Okay, we, we have a couple of guesses being yelled out. How many people say one? How many people say two? No one says two, how many people say three? Okay, someone who said one, make an argument. Who said one? Raise your hands again. You. Small string optimization. This is not something guaranteed by the standard, but if you want to have a standard library that's able to compete, you have small string optimization. So almost certainly one. We will have our A and B will fall into small string optimization. We're doing one allocation for the vector. So, uh, std string is highly optimized. Do not underestimate it. For real, if you saw the talk that I gave at C++ Now this year, you will see that std string messed with a lot of my benchmarks. All right, now how many dynamic allocations do we have? It's not long enough. <laughs> the comment was it's not long enough. Let's, let's say with, how many people say there's one dynamic allocation still? No one, uh, two, three, four. One person half-heartedly raised his hand for four. Okay, oh, you wanna change your vote. Okay, um, wait, how many says there's five? Exactly one, oh, oh. Yeah, okay, all right, all right. I see who else is raising their hands in the back here. Um, okay, you said five. As far as people who can actually interact with me, why five? Well, I don't, I mean, not sure, but I think the initializer list of string was the vector constructor date. I'm not sure if that's our value reference, if there's an overload for it, because otherwise, if there's not, then it has to construct two more strings than the memory allocated for the vector. Yes. Okay, so basically initializer list can't be moved from is what your effective answer was. We have a initialize, well, the answer is five. Why? I'll break it down. Because the compiler has done this for us. It has created an underlying uh, ref, um, excuse me, array of string objects. So those must be initialized, that is one and two, and then we must allocate the space for the vector, which is three, and then we must copy those strings into the vector, which is four and five. 
like that. So five allocations here. Who was surprised by that one? Everyone, except for those three people. Yes? Why is it initializer list? Uh, oh, oh, uh, so if you look at the, this is where I'm making the cameraman's job harder, but I'm so sorry. If you look at the, um, uh, the constructor that takes an initializer list for vector, it is an initializer list of string. Therefore, the underlying array that is created for the initializer list object is itself an array of string. That is what the standard requires it to be. That is why it is not an array of const car star. We will have, I think, more satisfying examples for you in just a moment. The question was, why is it an array of const strings and not an array of strings? Oh, an array of const strings, and not, uh, yeah, I, because it's not, it's not movable. And if you look at the, the accessors on an initializer list, it only has const accessors anyhow. So it, it's irrelevant, really. We, we would, a lot would have to change. And if I, I did, well, I did an hour and a half long rant at C++ Now about that called initializer list are broken. So I'm not gonna go into it right now, and, and much more. Um, can it be optimized? Not in any way that I'm aware of. Uh, no, um, uh, heap elision with Clang might be able to optimize it, but I've never seen Clang allied two heap operations. I've only seen it allied one. Yes? Let's keep going. Oh, if you had to do it at runtime? Okay, if it were const data and you can't make that, well, do you know how many objects it is? If you always know the number of strings, you can do better. Yes? You might get only four. You might get only four. Because you can merge the two values. Of the two strings? Yeah. They both have, no, you can't merge the two of them. They have to be two different. I don't believe any compiler would do that because each underlying string object has to have a distinct pointer to its data that it can manage separately. And Malik is. Not a function. And Malik is it can do that. Oh, so, okay. Because of the as if rule, it's hypothetically possible that some of the Maliks could be merged. Okay. I have seen things. Yeah, I have seen. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I have seen things. Okay. So initializer list invocations create hidden const arrays. That's our surprise here. Um, how many dynamic allocations does this code have? Okay, how many, who, who says zero? Okay, who says one? Two? Three? Is anyone gonna go as high as five today? <laughs> Can I get six? I have to go into like uh, bidding mode here. Okay, it's zero, it is zero, because we're using C++ 17's class template type deduction, it's going to deduce this as a const car star of two elements, no allocations. So yes, if you know what the strings are, you can do perfect. Okay, um, is this okay? Yes, okay. We know that our character literals are valid for the life of the program. Now how many dynamic allocations do we have? <laughs> one, so who says one? Two. Uh, pretty good number of people say two. Three, four. Handful of people are saying four. Okay, you're saying four, all right. Yes, I overheard the answer already. It is two because this is not an initializer list. What is the difference? Well, it is, okay, it is an initializer space list. If you're looking this up in the standard, it is not an object of type initializer underscore list. You have to keep those separate when we're talking about initializer list. I, I don't have the vocabulary to keep them separate without saying all of those words. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm missing a pair of curly braces. Okay, clang user. 
You know there are situations with Clang where it says extra br br braces r r suggested, and you can put like 75 and it's still giving you that warning. It's a little, <laughs> um, yes. So this is why. Standard array has no constructor. We are directly initializing the data of the array. Now, interestingly, you notice this underscore capital M elms. I, I, I don't know if it's lib C++ or lib stood C++ that literally uses this name, but I did look it up. I was reading through the source of array, as one does. And um, OK, so we, we, mere mortals, are not allowed to create an identifier with this name. This is reserved for the standard, an underscore followed by a capital letter. And therefore, we are also not allowed to rely on the name of this thing. It is undefined behavior if we access something with this name as well. So they are, they, the people who implement the standard library, they're allowed to do this. We're not allowed to do this. They're allowed to do this, and then they can punish us if we try to access this thing. They're allowed to. So this is, um, anyhow, we're directly initializing the uh, array. Yes, Michael. The, the example that you had with the class member about the instruction. Yes. And the initializer list was parse body. But yes. Is there a reason it wasn't like characters of array length? Is there a reason why it wasn't characters of array length? Um, if you have multiple, I, uh, uh, I, don't know, I don't know the exact wording. I don't know the exact place in the standard. But I've, from my experience, if it were one of these, it would be a character array, plausibly. With two of them, it has to deduce the common type, which is going to be car, 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 const car star. That's, I'm almost positive that's what's going on. Because you see the same kind of behavior if you've got a, um, uh, a ternary that's returning two different strings of the same length and that kind of thing, too. Yes? Uh, oh, you're saying, oh. Uh, Leslie said it would decay to a pointer because it's uh, a template argument by value. I'm not, yeah, I think that's right. You actually have to specialize the template based on the array. All right, anyhow, that's aside. OK. Um, so this is literally the most efficient thing possible. This is my surprise. This is how I, I wanted to phrase this. Standard array has zero constructors for efficiency. Just let that sink in. If you've seen any of the talks um, from Nico about like uh, initialization of trivial t classes, and he goes to great lengths to explain how you need all of the different constructors to get things as efficient as possible, I'm not saying you go back to your job and start writing all of your classes with all of your members public and don't have any constructors. I'm just saying this. <laughs> All right, on to something different, wherever my water went. What do we have? I think by now you know the rules. A new slide comes up, you tell me what happens. OK, so we have git s, which is create an object of type s which is then immediately calling an object of type get data, and then we're printing, the, or excuse me, calling the function called get data, which is returning a vector of ints by const reference. All right, so what's printed? One. Undefined, unknown. All right, we can break this down. It is unknown because if we have a ranged for loop, this is literally what the standard says that the compiler is doing. An auto ref ref Yes. Auto ref ref would extend the lifetime of the thing returned by git s, not the thing returned by git data from git s. It is not recursive object lifetime extension. It is unknown because we have a dangling reference to the object of type S. Oh, look, I even put dangling reference on the slide. It's like I knew it was coming up. Um, what warnings do we get from the compiler? So where I get ahead of myself now. Um, I'm pretty sure we're at, uh, yeah, no warnings with Clang. 
and no warnings with GCC. Those are the compilers I have at my disposal at the moment. Yes? So uh, no skip warnings either with that WI tag, because that's the example I tried to submit. Oh. That's W lifetime doesn't warrant. Is that one of the, n that's, that's Herb's the Herb's new extension? Okay. Well, that's interesting that it's not correctly diagnosing this, and I will explain why on the next slide. C++ 20 is for init. This was added in C++ 20 specifically for this exact kind of case, which I find is interesting that the lifetime warnings aren't catching it then. But it's probably, it's difficult. These are difficult problems to catch at static analysis time. At least I have to assume they're difficult because people aren't doing them and I've never written a static analyzer. An analyzer. Okay, so C++ 20 lets us do this. Now, just for the record, if you try this in your pre-C++20 compiler, you'll probably get some weird warning about how you're like missing the last par third part of your for loop, because now we're getting into a syntax that looks, like as far as the number of semicolons required and stuff, um, it looks pretty much like it's a regular um, for loop. But we can see here that the compiler now generates code like this for us. It has a const uh, auto S, we can see that line is just copied in from line 12 down to line 13, and then it is using its auto ref ref on the range object. Any questions? How is this different from the... Well, uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, sorry. How is this different from the previous example of a recursive reference to selection? That was recursive reference on initialization, not on return values. That is the difference as far as the standard is concerned. Uh, wait, there was, yes. Um, well, if I had done auto ref s, I would have recreated the exact same problem. I would have created, oh no, it would be const, if I had done const auto ref, that would have been allowed here, but it would have been uh, exactly the same thing. We still would have had exactly one object of type s created. It's just whether or not you used the const reference lifetime extension rules or you used return value optimization. Yes. Yes. No, no, wait, just for the record, I did not suggest having no constructors. <laughs> yes, if I had not had a function called get data here, it would have worked fine. That is correct. It actually took me a while to carefully craft these slides to make my point. That's, that, that's like a, a, a little secret. People spend a lot of time trying to get the exact example that they want you to comment on. All right, so our range for loops create these hidden variables for you that have their own questions of lifetime that we have to be aware of. My time, I am moving too slowly. Okay, what warning might we get from this code? Shadow, shadow warning. We can break it down, and I'll start to move a little bit faster. X shadow is a previous declaration of X. So this is the code, and we will expand it out one block at a time. So this auto, const auto X equals git val, it's as if we had done this. We created a new scope. I know the first time I presented this, people missed the scope that was created on line five. That is not the opening curly for main. That is a new explicit scope. So there's a new scope where that X is created, and then we break it down further. We've got our inner X, so that's the one that shadows. So our surprise here, if and it statements are visible for the else blocks as well. I find teaching this that some people just don't expect that. It's, it's often the first question people ask about C++ 17 if and it stuff. Okay, um, this is, similar to these things. What is printed here? S print tilde S, okay. Um, now what is printed? I've got S print tilde S, okay. Who says same thing? Who says something more? All right, everyone who voted said same thing. So I like to point out 
This is required in C++ 17, but every compiler I've gone back to in 1995 does this. It's, it's, it's been a thing uh, for a very long time. The mechanism changed, though. The mechanism changed depending on your ABI. So this is no longer an optimization. Yes. Uh, as of the, what, Itanium IBA if I, ABI, if I'm being technically correct? No, no, no. Like, like it used to be RBO. Yes. Well, it's no longer an optimization okay, well, you know what? I'm almost out of time. Gashper's arguing that it's not an optimization because it's required. I would like to point out the mechanism by this actually works on most ABIs, is the object little s on line 16, its memory is allocated right here. A pointer to it is passed forward into get other s, which is passed forward into get s, which is initialized. That object never moved. From a compiler standpoint, there was nothing to optimize. It was always right there. Yes, Ben? Yes, prior to 17, you still had to have the copy constructor even though it was never gonna call it. Yes, which is a little annoying, but now, it, it, yeah, you don't have to. You guys, uh, yes, okay, so it's no longer an optimization, it's not under the ISF rule. All right. RVO is super awesome, or elision, whatever. Same, uh, dadgummit. Make me change my slides on the fly, because if I did this, What changes? Now it's in RBO. In RBO. And it's not it has another letter. <laughs> yes. Okay. The answer was now it is in RVO. Named return value optimization, I believe I have that correct. It is, um, it has another letter. We are going to get the exact same output from the compiler. It's, it's, it's good at these things. So I, it is, it's easy and I, I don't like copy elision. I don't like the phrase. Copy elision. I also don't like return value optimization since everyone's done it for 30 years. We, we shall move on. Okay. Where did my controller go? All right. All right. This is this is a little bit more complicated now. I've got this thing called a holder. I am constructing a holder with my function on line 14 called get holder. It is. Uh, initializing the return value, and then I'm calling dot s. So I'm initializing my local variable s on line 16 with this thing that was returned from a temporary, and then I'm returning that from the function, and then on line 21, I'm initializing this. All right. What's printed here? S paren. Uh, all right. What's the first thing that's printed? S paren. Let's, let's get that out. Right? Construct an s. What's the next thing that's printed? What's that? Move, did you say move constructor? Copy constructor, okay. Who says copy constructor? Who says move constructor? Okay, no one says move constructor. It is the move constructor. It is the move constructor because the thing returned from git holder is an R value, therefore it's a perfect candidate for calling the move constructor. That's the simple way of wording this. Um, so uh, on line 21, nothing is printed because as we said, that object little s on line 21 was actually like its memory was allocated here and it was passed forward and the things. Okay. So we have an s, a move constructor, and a, a destructor and a destructor. So moves happen automatically with our R values. Don't try to help the compiler. I have changed this to a structured binding. Now it's printed. Someone says the same thing. Who says move constructor? Now? Oh, and now no one wants to raise their hands for move constructor. Who says copy constructor? Okay, the rest of you have just given up. Okay, you're saying copy constructor. It is a copy constructor because the compiler says that this code was magically created for us. This object, S, that we thought was a local object is actually a reference to the temporary that was returned by the get holder function. 
question, shouldn't there be two copy constructors? No. Uh, 17, it should behave as if reference to subobject, but it's not a reference to subobject. It is not a reference, to, it is a... Is it alias? It is, yes, an alias. It is a, a no, sorry. Which one are we referring to? I mean, there, there's supposed to be a copy in 19 for sure, but I believe the 17 should also have a copy. No, no, that's definitely a reference. Okay. On line 17 is definitely a reference. That is, you can, you can look up the, the wording of, uh, of um, structured bindings and see these kinds of examples. Uh, I have had conversations with people involved in the standard that say we can't tear apart objects, so no, currently the as if thing can't do things here. But um, that is outside of my depth at the moment. Okay, so our structured bindings mess with our ability to get our moves. Um, so uh, in this code, is the destructor called? We are creating an object on line 12. Do we have any reason to believe the destructor of S is not called? It is not trivially destructible. It has a destructor right there that puts. So we expect to see tilde S printed? Okay. Now I have put a throw statement in my constructor. Do we see the destructor called? No. One, at least one constructor must be. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, so I'm getting yes, no, no, yes, yes, no, no, yes. Okay, uh, who says yes, it's, it is? I hope I didn't need that. I don't know what that is. Okay, who says yes, the destructor is called? Okay, who says no, it's not called? All right, the no's, the no's have more hands, so therefore that's the correct answer. Uh, this constructor call did not complete. The object's lifetime has not begun because its constructor has not completed. No, yet. Shh. <clears throat> okay. I have added a call to the delegating, uh, I've, I've added a delegating constructor call. Is the destructor called now? Okay, so I get some emphatic yeses from the front row. Um, yes, it has been called. Why? Lifetime starts with when the first constructor ends. When the first is yes, effectively when the first destructor exits is when the object's lifetime has begun. So when this default constructor on line seven is completed, the object's lifetime has considered to be, have begun, therefore, its destructor will be called. Now, if you really want to have fun when you want to play with this later, have a bunch of random, like, sub-objects that throw destructors at different points in construction and play with what gets printed and learn all kinds of things about how much work the compiler actually has to do to keep track of which objects properly had their lifetime begin so that it knows which destructors to call, and then thank your compiler developer for getting it all correct. Probably. <laughs> as, as far as I know, there's still an open bug for something about this in GCC that's like old. I forget the details, though. All right, so once the delegating constructor completes, the object lifetime has begun. So this is from a, I should have had a link to it, a, a rather popular um, post by Howard Hinnett on Stack Overflow. And this is the kind of example that he made here is that we can do interesting things to make sure that our uh, sub-objects' lifetimes are, just, are, are, are managed correctly. So if one of them were to throw an exception, like if the line eight were to throw an exception, we know that the object that was allocated on line seven would be properly cleaned up. This is valid defined behavior. However, I put it in really big letters. I hope you can read it. Don't do this at home. Use unique pointer. This is, a, this is, violates all kinds of like, never call new, never call delete, don't use raw pointers, um, don't uh, manage the lifetime of more than one object. Uh, yes, all kinds of best practices are violated here. 
So an object lifetime is begun after any constructor is completed. This is my, my bold title conclusion slide. Anywhere where the specs say the compiler transformed the code for you, there might be a surprise. If you get bored and you're reading through the standard, you will see some of these things. Avoiding these issues, we need to think about lifetime. We have our delegating constructor. It's just a waste of code, right? We can just return the first element if that's really what we wanted to do. So don't name temporaries. This helps us think about object lifetime correctly. If we don't have a name, we don't have to worry about it. Pretty much. Um, this is a thought. I, I haven't tested this in real life yet. Consider requiring that all your structured bindings actually be by reference. Because this then communicates that you are actually dealing with references here. You're going to get the exact same results, but now you have this, this note effectively in your code. I don't know. Who likes that idea? Handful of people. Who, who does not like that idea? I think it'd be more clear if you swap the top and bottom, but otherwise, it's good. <laughs> I will not repeat that comment. Um, using our tools. Um, Warn all the things. Thanks, Ben. Uh, w shadow catches some of these things. Clang tidy, core guideline checkers would catch many of these things. Um, the good, good warnings and our guideline checkers check all, any implicit conversion from an array to a pointer is caught. I love that. Um, sanitizers, every single one of these examples is trivially caught by a sanitizer. Are you using sanitizers on your code? Yes? If you're not, when you leave this session, go implement sanitizers in your continuous integration environment, which you're all using, right? Yeah, everyone has a CI of some sort? All right. So uh, be careful with the initializer list. Um, effectively, it was really only intended for trivial, literal types. Um, keep that in mind. Oh, uh, yeah, I can't skip this. Constex for all the things. This is an invalid dereference. We know this, right? I have like two minutes left. So, bam. Um, what does this code do? It fails to compile. Why? Because it doesn't allow undefined behavior. It says it right there on the slide. Good job. OK, taking this example where we have this, where C++ 20's four initializer, uh, four initializer is supposed to help save us here, this, um, this example caught by a, uh, it would be caught by a sanitizer. If we make the const expert version of it, we're in the exact same place. Compiler will not compile it because it sees undefined behavior. I can actually execute it or compile it real quick. We get a const expert variable is not initialized by a const expert. And I love the warnings that you now get in a const expert context that you can't get from basically any other tool. Read of object outside its lifetime is not allowed. What? In a constant expression. <laughs> but it's not allowed in general. If you can build your code in such a way that you can do const expert testing, you're going to catch many more potential bugs. Um, Similarly, string view is const expert enabled. We can do this. This version now refuses to compile. So, yes, I have 42 seconds left. Yes. Um, I'll leave that up. Any questions? Quick escape. Um, any questions? Yes. Do I know the rationale for the if the init variable is uh, visible in the else statement? Once you actually get used to using the if inits, it really is the only thing that makes sense. Because you're going to initialize a thing, and then you might want to take two different, uh, two different uh, actions on that object, depending on whether or not it was you know, some other thing evaluated true. It really is the only thing that makes sense. It, it, but it's, you, you're not necessarily thinking about it when you go to use it. Anything else? OK, so a question way. You might have to run up to the microphone or something, because there's one right here. 
run faster. You have n negative minutes left. Yes. Uh, I have a question about, uh, well, I think got, the NRVO portion got skipped quite a bit because the compiler can't possibly get all the cases of NRVO unless if you know that there's a unique source. Right. So. Yes. Well, if you talk, if you think about that, that, uh, that pointer that I said, that object that's created here and then a pointer is passed forward to it, it clearly, that pointer can only be in one place. It must only be used to initialize one thing. And you're right, if you have multiple, um, well, if you have multiple. Return statements. Return statements with named objects, then yes, then it, it, it's, it can't do the return value optimization the same way. One of them will get it and the other one will get a copy or whatever, or move, yeah. Sure. Okay. So, I mean, I, I just think if you're depending on NRVO, your code's gonna get very brittle. Oh, yes, if you're depending, okay, well, I don't need to repeat it because you're on the microphone. Um, I agree, which is why I also am pretty strong on this don't name temporaries if you don't have a reason to. I try really hard to not name the things I'm returning from functions personally. And it makes the code much more modular and makes my functions shorter and I'm happier in general. Anything else? I know it's time to go. I don't want to keep anyone over who needs to, like, you know, do whatever, eat dinner or something. All right, thank you.